everybody. Thanks for joining me here today. This is Nicole with Topaz, and today we are happy to welcome back Blake Rudis for Topaz and the Zone System Workflow. Hey, Blake. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. All right. How are you doing today? Well, I guess you really can't answer that because you're on the other end, but I hope you said great. <laughs> so <laughs> I want to start this by uh, thanking uh, Topaz Labs and Nicole for everything they do to put these on. Um, you know, I always start that uh, with with that in mind, uh, thanking you for, for this, this venue that you give us to uh, explore new options as artists and to see that from multiple different artists' perspective instead of just one uh, here and there. So that's that's awesome. Absolutely incredible venue. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is the uh, Topaz Labs and Zone System workflow. And one of the things that I've created over the course of time was the Zone System. So I um, kind of took Ansel Adams' approach to the Zone System with photography and actually using that to photograph your images to um, turn it into a workflow system that could be utilized to edit your images in Photoshop. So I'll be covering that today. Uh, as far as the extensivity, I won't be covering that uh, in extreme uh, extensiveness because there's a lot of resources on online about that, but uh, I will go in and talk about it as I'm going through. But the big kicker that I want you to get from this is not necessarily what the zone systems do. It's workflow and where things fit and all the pieces that come together to create your images. Because if you have an ineffective workflow, uh, you're going to have um, images that don't quite have the impact that you want them to have. So I'm going to cover kind of my thoughts and my theories on workflow. And this right here is what I consider the zone system workflow without Topaz Labs. So if you're not using any Topaz Labs products, this is what it would look like. But this is also kind of the workflow that I've developed over the course of years that does not require uh, the zone system. So basically the way it works is you follow the line. Start in Adobe Camera Raw or Lightroom, jump into Photoshop because of its power for layering, and then move on to these four items that are in your workflow items. So tone specifically, and then moving into color, and then artistic effects. And a lot of these, like a tone, the tone editing was all done with the digital zone system. The color editing was all done with the color zone system. And then the artistic effects, they all kind of uh, come into play and then merging and saving however you see fit to do that, whether you save for web, you save for print, whatever you save as. But this is the typical workflow that if you follow this, and you don't necessarily have to use the zone systems. Um, I would prefer that you use Topaz if you're not using the zone systems because they, they offer a lot of power there. But um, this is the, the outlined workflow that I use that I've developed over the course of many, many years. Now this is where it gets really busy. But anywhere you see these little green lines, these are detours in the workflow here that you can go and use Topaz in any one of those detour areas. Uh, so the, those are the good abrupt stopping points that you can go into uh, the Topaz products. And I will be outlining this as I go through this webinar today. Now, what I want to tell you though is that what you see in front of you may not work for you. Workflow in its nature is designed by the artist that is using it. So uh, what I do may not be what you do and that's perfectly fine. I don't want you to take this and say, well, Blake said I can't do that so I'm not gonna do that or Blake used this here or even if it's somebody else that you admire on the web that might be um, you know, uh, one of the, the bigger names in photography that you see doing this. Don't get hung up on what they do just look at what happens. I also want to talk about this webinar here and don't necessarily worry too much about trying to get all of this information in because I'm going to give you a lot. If you walk away with one gold nugget of information, then you learn something today and that's important. All right, so don't get hung up on all the stuff that you don't know. Get hung up on something that you just learned that you can implement today. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into Photoshop and we'll get into this workflow. This is the PDF that uh, Nicole had referred to at the very beginning. So I'll go ahead and close this out. This is what our end result is going to look like, the little uh, image here, nice and uh, made a nice little pretty background for it. So I'm just going to go ahead and open up this example TIFF here. Uh, basically what you're looking at is an HDR image that was run through Photomatix to get a baseline image. Now what I'm trying to do with that is really just kind of get um, a sense of, um, get all my exposures on the same level playing field. If you saw this room, it was very, very dark inside, and the, the highlights that were coming in were very, very bright. So it's a, it's a, it was a difficult situation to expose, expose perfectly. This is a one-room schoolhouse in Kansas. There's a, um, there's a place there called the Tallgrass National Preserve. 
absolutely wonderful place. You know, people fly over Kansas all the time, and they just call it a flyover state. But really, it's got some beautiful things in there, from the sunflowers to this tall grass national prairie. Amazing place. But so you can see there's no lights in here. They didn't have any lights on. Uh, it, they've got it preserved from an old 1800s um, schoolhouse, one-room schoolhouse. So there was a lot of things that I had difficulties shooting in here. So I was on a tripod, tripod mounted, um, typical HDR F8, um, three brackets, plus two, minus two, and zero. That's my typical HDR workflow in the camera. So then I brought into Photomax and made a baseline HDR image. What I mean by that is nothing that's too bright, too dark, oversaturated. Um, you're basically trying to just make a bland image. It, if you think about when you're making soup, uh, you kind of want to make soup um, that as it's cooking doesn't have a whole lot of flavor, but towards the end, in that last hour or so, after you take that sip, when all the stuff is kind of done, you got all the flavor from the vegetables coming through, you take a little sip of your broth to see if it's any good, and then you start to add the spices later. That's exactly how I look at my HDR workflow. I want a bland soup, and I want to build on my soup after it's been cooking for a while. So I started off in Photomatix and then I come into Adobe Camera Raw. I do what I call the boring stuff in Adobe Camera Raw. If you don't use Adobe Camera Raw, you are free to use Lightroom as they operate on the same engine if you're using Lightroom's develop module. So what I'll do here with the boring stuff is anything that I want to be saved in the 16-bit TIFF that I created in Photomatix. So what is that kind of stuff? This is like the initial uh, reduce the chromatic aberrations, fix the, the warp from the lens. I mean, this was a 16 to uh, 35 millimeter lens that I was using here. Uh, so it's one of those things that um, you know I want to fix the, any, any perspective that might have been warped here and just fix all the preliminary stuff. I'm not even going to do anything with tone or color in Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to do all of that with Topaz Labs and the zone systems. So I'm going to zoom in real close here and find any areas where there would be chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration are these little magenta and cyan things that come on your image. And that's basically the way light reflects and refracts off of your lens glass and bounces onto your sensor. I'm not a mathematician or a scientist. Um, I do understand light and I understand what happens there. But uh, these chromatic aberrations, all I know is I don't want them in my photograph. Okay, so I'm going to go over to where it says lens corrections, and I'm going to, get, going to go to go to color and go to remove chromatic aberrations. Now, sometimes just clicking this box will remove them enough. Other times, you'll see that there's still a little bit of chromatic aberration around those edges. So I'm going to increase my purple amount and increase my green amount. And you'll see that they're almost gone. Those chromatic aberrations, what we looked at before, that's a chromatic aberration there, and here's a chromatic aberration now. Uh, so what you need to do if you still see a little flare of it is just move this over to the right to get rid of that hue. So now we have no purple chromatic aberration. I'll move this over until we have no green chromatic aberration because sometimes chromatic aberration has a different hue than uh, the other chromatic aberration from a different image. So it's not always going to be the same. So you might need to modify these chromatic aberrations to get that to fit. All right. Now, this is one of those things that I have a serious pet peeve towards. I see a lot of great images on the web, but when I see a chromatic aberration or maybe a tilted horizon line, it just kind of irritates me. It's like, ah, oh, you went so far to make such a great image. Why did you stop there? You know, you get those little nitpicky chromatic aberrations to just eat me away eat me alive. <laughs> and the other thing is if you increase any saturation in your purples or your greens, you're going to increase the saturation not just in the purples and the greens in the photo, but then you're going to create these really stark lines around anything that has chromatic aberration in it and make it even worse. So keep that in mind. The next thing I would do is maybe go into the lens profile. Now, this is a TIFF, so it's not going to have any of my uh, Canon uh, information on it uh, like it normally would in the raw file. So I'm just going to ballpark estimate. This is a this is a Canon and I'll say it's the 17 to 40 millimeter lens just to fix it. It was a 16 to 35, but it's okay. The 17 to 40 will work just fine for this example. So from there, I could just open this right up into Photoshop and I don't have to worry about uh, doing anything else in Adobe Camera Raw. Now, if you wanted to, you could, but like I said, this is workflow specific and we're going to talk about workflow. My workflow is different than your workflow have a party with yours. That's awesome. So what I'm going to do here is go into Topaz Clarity. Now, if you want to use smart objects, you are free to use smart objects. Uh, I'm going to prefer not to for the sake of the webinar, just because it will slow down my machine. Smart objects uh, do not like the zone systems too much because they are very layer intensive. So I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and Topaz Clarity. 
Now, one of the reasons why I'm using clarity in the beginning is clarity is very intuitive. And actually, uh, if you want to look at clarity as being a mini zone system, that's what this is. Okay, so Topaz Clarity has a ton of power in it uh, because it's not like the clarity slider that you see in Lightroom or Adobe Camera Raw. This is clarity. Um, with a, a hint of excellence to it. It's not just one slider that you move over. Uh, it's now micro contrast, low contrast, medium contrast. They've got all these different amounts of contrast clarity built in right into this program. Makes it phenomenal for starting off the image. So what I'm going to do is basically just take this image and build it up so that when I use the zone systems, everything will be even more perfect. All right. So. Anytime I jump into Clarity, you've got all these different collections over here and presets that you can use over here. If you've ever seen any of my stuff before, I'm really not a, a preset kind of guy. Um, I like to go based off of what the image needs and not based off of preset. Presets are great places to start, but I'm more of a fan of understanding what needs to happen to my image rather than using a jumping off preset. But you are free to do whatever you want. Like I said, this is workflow and it's your beast. Know how to tame it. So we're going to go into the histogram because the histogram gives us all the gorgeous information that we need to understand in our image as we edit. Blacks are on the left, whites are on the right. So you can see this area right here is actually a blown highlight. I was aware of that when I was there. This is a blown highlight. The windows are blown highlights. And sometimes you have people that are like, oh my gosh, he's got blown highlights in this image. I am done. And that's fine. They can be. But what I have to say to individuals like that is that Blown highlights happen in, in the natural world, all right? So if you're in this room, if you would have seen the amount of blown highlights that were coming through those windows because it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon with that sun just beaming right against those windows, there were blowouts in there. It was also very dark in areas where they, it wasn't beaming through the windows. What I say to that is embrace the blowout, all right? That doesn't mean to overexpose your images just for the fun of it, but that means if it is overexposed, don't really harp on it too much, okay? And that, that's the information that was there and that's what we're gonna go with. So on the right hand side, you can see that anything that's a blowout is probably this information right here and that's perfectly fine. I'm aware of that and I'm okay with that. That's how we nurture those blowouts to make them natural in our photo that you're gonna see in the end become the artistic piece to this. So if you're, um, if you're really harping on those as, as negative things, well, just watch and you'll see how you can turn a blowout into something that works in your favor. So with the micro contrast, these are all the really small details in the image. So I can go ahead and zoom into this uh, about 50%. That'll help us see it a little bit better. So with the micro contrast, uh, what I really do is just kind of move these around to see what looks good to my eye as I'm looking at the image. And obviously I want a little increase here. So I'm going to bring that up to about here. It looked about good right there. Same thing here. Just go to the low contrast, bring it down, and then bring it up. See what your eye likes. That's a little too much. We want a little bit in that low contrast area. Now, if you watch what's happening, watch the histogram. Watch the histogram as I make these edits. The histogram will move all over the place. That's an indicator as to what could be wrong in the image and what needs to be fixed. Keep that in mind because I'm going to show you a trick for that. Increase the medium contrast. All right. So just kind of manipulating these sliders back and forth until I see something I like. And with the high contrast, I typically leave this at zero because high contrast becomes really big blocks of information. If I move this over all the way to the right, you can see that uh, that's where we get really dark pits of black, and I don't really want that in this image. So as I said, the histogram will tell us everything, right? So the histogram is telling me that things are really black in the areas of this image. So what do I need to do? Well, you can see down here we have black levels, midtones, and white levels. Well, if I want the black levels to be more black, I move it to the left. As I move that black level to the left, it forces my histogram to the left, within, which in turn makes everything more black. If I move it to the right, it starts to help that out a little bit. See how the difference is there now? And that's what I want. I want some pure black in this image, but none to the point that it's clipped, because that information, like right here, that, that white information is clipped. There's nothing I can do to fix that. It will always be pure white. It's beyond white. Um, it, it's, it's in a realm of white that we can't even see with our human eye. Okay? So then with the, with the midtones, you can push kind of the midtones of the image to the left or to the right on the histogram. So I don't want it to the left because that makes it kind of muted and dull. But if I move that to the right a little bit, that might add some brightness to this image and give me a nice good base to work off of when I jump into the zone systems. So then white, if we move that over to the right, it's going to make things a little bit brighter, but see how those blowouts now get a bunch of friends around them. We have to be cognizant of them and nurture them. Okay, so we're going to move that to the left a little bit, dull them down. 
So there's basically a mini digital zone system, and in here is basically a mini color zone system. So you can see that there's a lot of blue in this image, and I don't really like it. There's a lot of blue that's happening right here in, uh, in, in the ground area where around that highlight. I'm not a big fan of that. So if you go into the saturation, you can actually drop the saturation of the blues, just the blues. So the saturation just kind of goes away and tapers off just a little bit. And that looks about right right there. I don't want to go too far on the blues to the point that I lose the blue in the American flag. Now, obviously, I can go into masking and paint with masking if I want, but I'll do that later. Same thing with the oranges here. Now, the oranges of the seats, wood, will give you the hardest time in the world when you're photographing it. Ask any real estate photographer that has to go into a kitchen that has a lot of natural wood, and you HDR that, that orange um, becomes incredibly orange, an orange that you've never seen before. So I'm going to drop the orange a little bit to make it a little bit darker, and then I'm going to go to my luminance. Luminance is, saturation is how much color is there. Luminance is uh, how bright is that color. So you can see we can make the orange really bright, or we move this down, we can make the orange really dark. Now you'll see coming up here how the color zone system and the topaz clarity kind of tie in together. Uh, very well. So we'll move that up with the blues, move that down with the blues, maybe make those blues a little bit darker. And again, I can't go too dark because then it makes my blowout down there look pretty nasty. So that's a good baseline for me to go off of to start with. And then we'll go ahead and just open this up and this will let me into the, the uh, zone systems. So that was the first detour. We went from Adobe Camera Raw into Topaz Clarity and now let's run the zone systems. Basically what the zone systems do is it's just a, um, I don't know what the politically correct term to call this is, so we'll just call it a psycho way to work on tone, okay? It, it's a psycho-targeted, yeah, there we go, that might be politically correct, way to, uh, to target tone. So you saw them before, we had four basically kind of zones, but when I press play on this action that's in the zone system action, it's going to give you all of the zones that Ansel Adams represented on the zone scale. So zone zero being pure black, zone 10 being pure white, and everything in between being other values of the gray scale as you go. So basically what your camera meters for, if you are in spot metering and you spot meter for something, you're telling your camera, hey, I want you to tell me that that is zone five. So that's why when people spot meter for the clouds, then the clouds are nice and exposed, but then the ground is really dark or vice versa, they spot meter for the ground and the clouds are all blown out. That's because you're telling your camera, hey, I want you to tell me that that is zone five. Okay, that's, base, that's the basic premise behind the zone system. So what it does is it, it'll modify everything in between. It says, okay, if you want me to tell this to be zone five, then everything else is gonna be zone four, three, two, one, zero, and upwards accordingly. And it'll kind of misplace uh, all of those other areas within the scene along their uh, tonal values. That's all stuff that's happening in the camera you don't even know. Okay, so what this does is if I press Alt or Option on these masks, I can now see all the areas where each one of these zones will be affected. So really, um, I don't want to get too far into the inner workings of this, but if you look, as I move the curves, that's just that black area. I can open it up in the really darkest dark areas, or I can make it even darker. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to kind of go through here pretty quickly and show you uh, as, I'm, as I make these modifications kind of what I'm thinking as I'm going. I definitely want those areas that are black to be darker. And you're probably thinking, Blake, why would you start with a baseline image just to make everything darker? Why would you do that in the beginning? And the idea is kind of like, have you ever heard of someone who uh, maybe fractured a bone, um, but then the best thing to do would be to break it to fix it because it won't regrow right? It's the exact same thing here. Sometimes you have to break something in order to fix it, or in this case, sometimes you have to start with the most bland of an image to bring it up, and not try to start with the best at first, but start with a baseline to build up on. That's the whole point of the zone system workflow. And you're seeing all these layers, you're probably like, whoa, this is crazy, but notice what I said before. It's layer intensive, not labor intensive. Okay, that's very important to understand. So if we move this down, uh, that's zone two. We're getting into our, we're transitioning from our very dark areas into some of our lighter areas of gray value. But you can see with the curve, the difference between something like Topaz Clarity uh, and this is that you get a tone curve for each one of those individual zones instead of a slider. So you can say, okay, make the darkest areas of that dark area darker, but make the lightest areas of it a little bit brighter. See how that works? It's pretty interesting, and there's a lot of fail-safes that are built in to these zone systems. A lot of people ask, is this luminosity masking? No, this is not luminosity masking. Uh, this is uh, slightly different than luminosity masking because the adjustments are made 
differently, much differently, actually. Um, how I created the zones here are much different than what you would see in luminosity masking. So as I go through, I'm really just looking to see what I want this image to look like. I do want it to get darker, but I don't want to work too dark too quick. All right, so you make small adjustments, very finite adjustments, in order to get the image that you want. And this is uh, how I do all of my workflow, really. Uh, and you might think, well, this is crazy. You do all this for all your images? Yes, but I also have an automated way that I do this, where I just record the action that I'm doing, and I can press play on any image later, and it does all the work for me. So um, it can be very intuitive. It can be very intuitive. So with zone six, this is where we start transitioning from your mid-grays into your lighter whites. So with zone six, if I uh, bring this up and bring it down, it's, it happens really quick. So that's because we're in the RGB channel. We're in the luminance channel, which is all your red, green, and blue combined to make your luminance channel. All right. If I go into just, say, the blues, and I move this, it's a more subtle occurrence of modifying the tone in there, and I like that. All right, so I, blue is my go-to option. If I notice that one of the curves is taking my image way too far, I'll go into blue because this is set to luminosity. It's not set to normal because if it was set to normal, it would make the image blue or uh, yellow. But because it's set to luminosity, it's affecting the tone of the color blue, not the color of the color blue. Kind of confusing to wrap your head around, but just think about that one as I go through here. So zone seven, uh, same thing, just kind of go through here, see what happens. Um, this is called uh, tone compression. If you've ever seen tone compression on steroids, this is tone compression on steroids. You're telling uh, an area of tone to be something that it's not. So I'm not going to do that. I just wanted to show you that because some people are like, well, what is tone compression? Well, it's where you say, hey, uh, I know that this color doesn't exist there, but I want this to be darker. So do something. So it compresses it, makes it really nasty and dark. If you hear that word, uh, over tone compression, that, that, that can happen. So with zone 8, um, this is pretty interesting. With zone 8, you can kind of just go in here with these light areas and push this over. Bring out some of the texture that's around that uh, blowout. And then with zone 9, again, bring this up, bring it down, and that's going to be um, kind of bad. So I'll go into that, that blue channel. Blue channel is really what I use a lot when I get into these later zones. So I'll bring that up and I'll do the same thing with zone 10. Because as you see, like all these zones, this is, this is all my whitest white areas. So this is also a good mask. I can borrow this mask and use it on anything else I'd like. All right, so now uh, I've run the digital zone system. I'm going to run the color zone system. And this is basically the same concept but for color instead of tone. So it'll spit out my red, orange, yellow, green, cyan, ultramarine, blue, all the different colors of the spectrum, or the color wheel, we should say, and it's going to give it to me in, in curves, just like you saw with tone. Now, this is what it's going to spit out. It's a nasty-looking, oversaturated image. Don't worry about it. This is our dump file. What this, what this did is it duplicated our, our work, made it oversaturated so we could pull the best masks from it, and then we'll just drag this and drop this by pressing and holding shift and put it on top of our work. So now it's not going to do anything. Actually, what the system is doing is nothing. It's not actually doing anything. This is our dump layer. We'll go into the color zone system, and now we have the color red. So the difference between any other program or plugin out there is that it can't tell you what the color red is that you're modifying, but the zone systems can. So with the color red, we can now modify the tone in the color red. Now red uh, does have a lot of orange in it also. So you'll see that with red, there's a lot of uh, what's going on with orange also. But the beauty of this, like I said before, it's on a curve. So you can say, okay, I want the darkest portions of the color or the mid-tone portions of the color red to get a little bit, little bit brighter, but I want the brightest portions of the color red to get even more brighter. See how that works? Pretty interesting. All right, so we'll go into uh, orange. And again, I don't want to go too far into the zone systems because I want to cover how this fits with the uh, Topaz workflow. So press Alter Option here. You can see orange and then yellow likewise. We can come in here and kind of see what we want yellow to look like. So you're also modifying tone in the colors as well here. So before we were just modifying tone, now we're modifying the tone in the color also with the color. So this is where you become like a painter with color on your photographs. Um, a lot of my background comes from painting, so uh, it helps to have a good painting background. So you have the greens here. Uh, you can see kind of what green is doing here as we zoom in. Um, back here, we move this up and down, you can kind of see what's happening with green. But also see that up here, this little picture of George Washington that's unfinished, uh, it's got some green there too. Well, I guess I guess finished is a relative term. Maybe that was done in that artist's opinion. All right, so we'll look at cyan. 
And we'll just bring this down because there's a lot of cyan that's back here in the chalkboard, so we'll bring that down. Go into ultramarine. Do the same. Blue. Do the same. And just kind of lighten up those areas there. And in the color blue, you can also go into the individual channels of the color blue and make certain areas a little bit lighter if you wanted to. So I'm within the color blue, and I see that around this blowout, there's a little bit of blue kind of nastiness going on around there. So I can bring this down so that that blue channel gets a little bit of yellow added to it. And I can do the same in something like the cyans if I wanted to as well. So I'll go down into that blue channel and just kind of add a little bit of yellow to that. See how that blue got out of control? If we add some yellow to it, it's going to subdue it. And that's kind of a complementary color idea or complementary color principle there. And then after that, we can just, we're at the point where we've got tone and color pretty well modified here, and it looks pretty good. And at this point, this is where I would transition into maybe doing some of my finishing touches. So at this point, I would use something like Topaz Detail. So uh, the idea here is to pull away from this, is just work on tone, work on color, and then do some of your finishing touch stuff, and then go into your artistic effects. Don't try to start your image with the artistic effects. You'll find that you're not going to come out in the end the, the right way that you want to be. So I'm going to press Control, Shift, Alt, and E. Again, that's Control, Shift, Alt, and E. Command, Shift, Option, E on a Mac. I'm going to rename this Detail, because now I'm going to go into Topaz Detail. Go to Filter. Topaz Labs and Detail. The reason why I do it on a new layer uh, is because I don't want anything underneath that layer to be destroyed in the process of me editing. It's called non-destructive editing. So if I do something here in Topaz Detail that I don't like, I'm not stuck with it. And that's that's kind of how you want to operate. Okay. So with Topaz Detail, um, if you've ever used Detail before, you can get some really insanely detailed images. Again, there's a bunch of presets over here, and you're free to use those. Uh, but you the idea is kind of uh, self-explanatory here. The small details, those little micro contrast areas are going to get highly detailed. The med med medium details are going to increase also, and the large details, you can increase those as well. So with, with Topaz Detail, what I really like about it is that this could be used for output sharpening, or it could be used for more artistic effects, like creating a kind of like a grungy look in this image. Now, if you're looking at this, you are going to think I'm absolutely insane, because it's overly detailed, it's overly sharpened, but again, it's one of those things. If you want to make something better, sometimes you have to break it or sometimes you have to make it ugly. So I challenge you to try this. If you have Topaz Detail, just go in there and bring your detail, small details up to 0.25, your medium details up to like 0.25, and do the same thing with your large details. And typically, I would not suggest this, but I'm going to show you a little technique in Photoshop that can make this really awesome. Again, this would be a Photoshop only type of thing. But we'll go in, uh, also with Topaz Detail, you have a lot of uh, tone control here too, so you can modify the exposure if you'd like to also, and, and really um, get really deep into this image. But what I'm doing it for right now is just an artistic output sharpening type of look. Okay, so I'm going to press OK. And right here we have our nasty looking detail. And that's okay, that's okay. Because we have something in Photoshop called Blend If. So if I double click inside of here, we have this Blend If area. Don't look at anything else. Just concern, concern yourself with this area right here. What this is saying is that this is the layer that we want to modify. But there's other things that are underneath. And the underlying layer is anything happening underneath this layer. So what do we want to do? Don't, don't think of the term blend if. Think of it as protect. Okay. So if I move this over, I'm going to be protecting my black areas in the image. So if we look at this image, I'll zoom in to, let's say, this chair. Uh, this will give us a good selection of our black areas. I'm protecting anything black underneath this image, underneath the, the layer that's on the top. So if I move this over, it happens in like a pixelated type of way. But if you press Alt or Option, so if I move this all the way over, it's, it's starting to not even affect anything, even in our midtones. But if I press Alt or Option, click right here, it'll allow me to feather this in. So I get a nice smooth transition. All right, same thing on your highlights. You can just feather this over. Press Alt or Option and feather this over. So now, when we look at that detail, if we look at our before and after, let's go into our history. Here's before. It's na nasty, grungy, um, not very good. Well, we change the blend if options. One of the really interesting things you can do with this is if we press Alt or Option on this eyeball, we'll only see what's happening on this layer. And we'll go back into those blend if principles. Now we have this layer up here. You can see that there's certain areas of black that are in this layer that are going to be affecting anything underneath it. 
All right, so if I move this to the right, you start to see that now it's not going to be affecting anything that's starting to disappear. So that's a pretty interesting little trick here, especially if you only have the eyeball on this. So the only layer you're watching is this layer right here. This will allow you to modify this so you can see exactly what your what this modification for this detail is going to be affecting. It's only affecting the stuff that you see, and that's really awesome. Um, so that's so now if we look at this, we just have a nice kind of sharpened area around, especially if we look at our bench seats here. They are nicely sharpened. They look like real wood. They don't look like fuzzy wood. They look like real wood. This can be something that really helps you, especially in the HDR process, where things start to get kind of fuzzy. But I don't want it to be affecting the background area. So what I'm going to do is just click on here and create a mask. So what masking does is anything you paint with black, it will make it go away. Anything you paint with white will make it come back. Okay. So I'm going to press a D to default my colors over here to black and white and press X to switch to black, and then press B for the brush tool. Uh, one of the things that you can really help yourself with is to learn the hotkeys. I highly suggest that. Another thing you can do to see what you're editing is if you hit the forward slash key, it's right next to your right bracket key on the keyboard, that will get you into what's called quick masking. And quick masking will show you that as you paint, anything that's red is stuff that you're taking away. Okay, so I don't want anything here to be affected by this. Let me make my brush a little bit smaller because that's rather large. The only thing I really want to be affected is anything in the lower third of this image. Well, it's basically in the forefront of the viewer's eye when they're looking at the photograph. So anything right here, we'll just go ahead and get rid of that. I'll keep that bucket the way it is. So now these areas will not be affected by the detail that we've just added here. And uh, if you press Alt or Option on that mask, it'll show you in black and white. So you can see I missed this spot. I'll paint that in, paint that in, paint that in. These are really helpful tips and tricks. So if you learn nothing else from me, at least you'll learn that. Okay. So now we've got Topaz Clarity. We did the zone systems for tone and color. We did Topaz Detail to get our image nice and sharp. So what I would call this right now is a technically almost perfect image. Now, with the extent of this right here, that kind of uh, blowout that's got blue around it, I know that's probably annoying a lot of you. So what I want to do is go to the Hue Saturation Adjustment layer, click on my uh, targeted adjustment tool and click on that color. It's going to be blue. I'm just going to desaturate that and maybe bring up the luminance on it to accept that as a blowout. And again, likewise, we can mask in only the areas we want. All right. So I can press Command or Control I to invert that mask and then paint with white to bring that back. Okay, so there we kind of fixed that nasty blue fringe that was happening on our blowout. So this is what I would call a technically perfect photo. I, I really like the direction that this has gone, mm -hmm. but I want to take it into an artistic realm that is just going to make this image exactly what I envisioned when I walked in. This is the communicative step of you as an artist communicating with your viewer what you want them to feel when they see the image. Not what you want them to see, but what you want them to feel, because that's important. If someone looks at your photograph and they don't feel anything, then you've done a really uh, a poor job of communicating your uh, concept to them. All right? And that's not to say that every image is going to make you feel something. All right? Maybe every image doesn't make you feel something, and that's fine. You don't have to feel something every time you look at a photograph. But if you as the artist want someone to feel something when they look at it, you have to take it to that artistic realm. And that's where the Topaz products just light the zone systems on fire. It's awesome. Uh, so what I'm going to do, again, to make that stamp, Control, Shift, Alt, and E, and that will make a visible stamp of everything that's happening down here, right here. If you don't know what that means, if I take away these previews right here, that is everything we've done on this layer. So that as we edit on this layer, it won't be destructive to anything underneath. So now I'm going to go into Topaz Glow. All right, Glow is a lot of fun. So let's go to Filter, Topaz Labs, and go to Glow. And glow can add these ethereal feels to your image that you just can't get uh, anywhere else. All right, um, the the way Glow works is um, when you look at it like this, Glow may not seem very uh, I don't know what you say, powerful, I guess. It looks more like a really artistic thing. Um, it can make some really interesting images. I will give you that. Uh, but would you want to do this to this photograph? 
Maybe not necessarily because this isn't the mood that I want someone to feel. I don't want them to feel like when they step on the floor they're going to get electrocuted, which sometimes that can happen with the glow stuff, which uh, sometimes animal portraits can look great with some glow on it. All right, but uh, a one-room schoolhouse that you walk into and you get shocked, <laughs> not so much. So I'm going to click on one of my favorites. If you go into the afterglow section and go to radiate, this is one of my favorites. And I'm going to use this as a baseline. And what I'm really doing here is I'm going to change the blend mode to soft light. And you'll immediately see that we get a nice glowing presence inside this room. And it's almost exactly where I want it to be. But I'm going to increase the glow strength so it's a little bit brighter. I'm going to decrease the effect sharpness so I don't see any of the lines from the glow. I'm going to decrease the detail strength so there's no lines from that glow. And maybe I'll increase that detail size to make it blow, blow out really big in this room so that all these areas of windows that are pushing that light out are blowing out in this scene. And I might do the same thing with my uh, brightness here. Let's see. We'll bring that detail size down. Let's bring the detail size down and then blow out the brightness a little bit here and maybe increase and decrease my contrast as I go and see if I like it. If I decrease the contrast all the way and then increase my contrast all the way, I like a really heightened sense of contrast here. And what you're seeing here is maybe not uh, what I want in the entire image as a whole, but there's pieces in here that I really do want on my photo when I go into Photoshop. So with this set to soft light, if we were to change this to normal, this is what glow would look like almost non-recognizable, okay? But let me change that back to soft light and I'll open this up in Photoshop. So with this open in Photoshop, I can change this to luminosity, just like we saw in the zone systems, so that this layer only affects tone and not color. So it preserves all of the tone in the image, uh, it preserves all the color from the previous area in the photos that I worked on and just modifies my tone. So it looks pretty good. But again, uh, maybe I need to drop the opacity a little bit because it's a little too much. And then maybe even go into my blend if options just like you saw before and make sure that it doesn't affect my black areas as much as it's affecting my midtones and my highlights. That's one thing here that you can do with these blend if options because this controls anything in the black area. And press OK. All right, so now I'm going to do the exact same thing again. Control, Shift, Alt, and E. And I'm going to give you my secret sauce that I use for Topaz Impression. Okay, so um, this is one of my super secret awesome things that I think is super secret and awesome. Um, if you don't like it, then um, don't add it in your workflow. It's that easy, right? So we'll go to Topaz Impression. And Topaz Impression is wonderful in that you can make some very artistic images very quickly. Just by the click of a button, you can make this look like it's a colored pencil photograph. Um, photograph that's been... Uh, colored penciled and, and it actually looks pretty good you know this is this is pretty interesting it looks like uh, almost like a um, what do you call it like a court sketch of the one room schoolhouse pretty cool stuff I really like all the stuff that you can do in Topaz Impression uh, when you use it, it you, you can use it two ways and the way I'm going to show you is a very subtle way as a kind of like a finishing touch to kind of mull over all of the detail in the image or you can use it as a painting so that you can make it look like an old school painting from the past and maybe print that out, print, put it on canvas and make it look great on your wall. I'm going to go to into the painting section. Uh, and what Topaz asked me if I could create a um, preset for Topaz Impression and I chose to use this oil glaze preset. It's one of my favorite presets. It reminds me of one of my painter friends from college. That's actually where I drew the inspiration from. Oil glazing was a process where you take oil paint and you add a, um, I think I believe it was liquid, you add liquid to it to thin it out and increase the opacity so that you can actually see through the colors. And if you know anything about oil painting, it takes a long time for oils to dry. But the beauty of it is that gives you a long time to mix the colors. So what he would do is he would add this stuff in, he'd paint on and create these buildup of atmospheric oils on top of the image. They were just phenomenal. And they took him like six months to do a painting. So you have a lot of paintings all going on at the same time. It was like people that read a lot of books all at the same time. It's kind of like this guy with paintings. So we'll press OK. Give us that oil glaze. Now, I don't want this to look like the image. I don't want it to look like this. Okay? So again, I'm going to go to luminosity to change it so that it only affects the tone and not the color. You can see before we have some blue traces on the back here. Let's go ahead and change that to luminosity so it affects tone, not color. Drop the opacity down. And what this does, when you drop the opacity to about 45%, it takes anything that's really detailed in the back and just obscures it a little bit. 
but I don't want that to happen across the entire photo. This is what gives me an atmospheric look in my photographs. If you've ever seen uh, some of my, my, my finished works, my finished what I call masterpieces, um, I'm usually using impression on it in a very subtle way that you would never know. You would absolutely never know. Okay? So now I'm going to make a mask on here, and I'm going to paint with the color black. Press D to default my colors to black and white, X to switch to black, and I'm just going to paint in areas that I don't want to have this impression look. So maybe this area here, um, maybe this area over here. Okay, that looks pretty good. I like what you've done here. I wish there were trees so I can call them happy trees, like my old friend Bob Ross. We go way back. Um, so I'm almost done, almost done. But one thing I need to do to polish all of this off is go into Topaz Restyle. Control Shift Alt and E. You can see a pattern here. Double click right in here, go to Restyle. And I'm going to go to Filter, Topaz Labs, Restyle. Now, Restyle is what I call, or what I guess anyone would call, color grading. All right? So, color grading is a way that you can make all the colors in your image feel unified. And that's what uh, is great about Topaz Restyle. So, I'm going to increase the size of this so we can kind of see. So, how do you pick a preset? Well, the way Topaz Restyle works is there's a, a lot of colored presets in here, and they are phenomenal. Uh, some of them can create some really interesting looks in your photograph. I'm going to go into this night preset. I want this to almost look like it's got a sepia vintage effect to it. So I'm going to go to this orange stained eve because it looks like an orange sepia tone. But I really want more choices for the color orange. So if you see right here, there's a little tag. It says, find other presets similar to the currently selected preset. So I'll click that, and now almost anything with the color orange in it shows up in my presets. And one of the ones that I really like, and I know that because I did a lot of prep work beforehand, is this fire brick red. So I'll click on fire brick red. And I want you to know that these colors are not being applied to your image at random. Anything on the left is going to be applied to your darks. Anything on the right is going to be applied to your brightest areas. How do I know that? If we go into the saturation, and I increase the saturation of this one all the way over to the right you'll see that all of the black areas got a lot brighter in saturation. If I do that over here, all of these areas get really bright in that one section. So I know exactly where these, where these colors are affecting. Now, do I like the way this looks right now? The answer is no. So what I'm going to do is go into the opacity and just drop the opacity down. I want, I want almost the like, look like cellophane, like colored orange cellophane to be covering my image. So here we have like a lot of dark, it looks like the, the color temperature is even off, but now this is really pleasing to my eye. And I might take this to the realm of, let's say, 40%. And from here, I can adjust the saturation and the luminance. I don't want to adjust the hue because the hue, these are all the colors that I wanted. I like these colors. If I modify the hue, then those areas are going to turn a different color. All right? So let's go into saturation, and we'll just kind of play with the saturation in these colors to see what my eye likes as I navigate through them. And... Uh, there we go. I'm just kind of playing around here. Nothing too crazy. Uh, and this is the kind of fun. You just kind of bounce around and say, okay, do I like that? Do I like that? No, nah, no. Nah. I mean, you're not stuck with it. We, we can always edit this later. It's non-destructive editing. All right. So let me go back into that saturation here. I kind of like that saturation in, in those yellow areas. And I'll press OK. So now the big question is, okay, you started with all this stuff. You created all these things. Now, is what you're doing in this really necessary? Is it necessary to run the digital zone system, color zone system, and all these other things? Well, let's take a look. Let's change this to something like color, just so we can kind of see what happens as we go through here. Okay, so we'll change this to color, and we'll go back down here. Let's take the eyeball off of this one. You can see that the digital zone system is definitely playing a factor in here. The color zone system, definitely playing a factor in here. I told you that these were small buildups of, of color and of tone that create the image in the end. Look what happens with Glow. Glow does some amazing things to this image. Again, it might not be uh, right in some areas, so I can go in here and make a mask and maybe kind of paint with black in some of these areas that I don't want to be affected with that glowing uh, window. Um, so I'm just kind of being kind of haphazard and quick here just to kind of show you. But the thing is, get the workflow nailed. If you learn nothing else from this, just these, these four things are what you need to understand. Tone, color, artistic effects, and when to merge and save. Okay, that's Those are the main things. At this point, I can merge all this down. I could save it as a TIFF. I could save it as a JPEG for printing. I could save it as a JPEG for social media. Um, but just understand that there are definite steps in, in what's called the workflow. If you jump into Photoshop and you just start 
blah, just playing around and moving sliders and doing this. And that. That's not workflow. That's chaotic. Okay. If you want to make masterpieces, you have to narrow yourself down into a workflow. Do you have to use mine? No. Do you have to use his own systems? No. Does it help? Yes. Now this is years of workflow experience being laid out in front of you because I've taken the time that it takes to narrow down workflow into something that works for me. This workflow might not work for you. But document your steps as you go through. Document every little piece of things that you learn from people. Don't just learn from me. Learn from everyone because if you learn from everyone, your workflow is going to be even better. All right. Thanks, Blake. This has been awesome. It's the end of the hour, so I want to go ahead and switch the screen back over. Awesome. If you want to follow Blake, you can check out his work and all the resources available at everydayhdr.com. If you have any questions that we weren't able to get to today, you can contact us at webinars at topazlabs.com, and we'll try to get back to you as soon as we can. If you're interested in signing up for upcoming sessions, definitely um, sign up for the newsletter at topazlabs.com slash webinars. We will have upcoming sessions listed at that site as well um, once I send out the newsletter. Thank you so much, Blake. This has been great. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. It's always an honor and a pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, we will hopefully have you again. And thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you have a great rest of the week. Bye, everyone.